and welcome to episode 389 of the Thinking LSAT podcast. I'm Nathan Fox. With me is Ben Olson. We are the founders of LSATdemon.com and the LSAT Demon Daily podcast. If you'd like to be LSAT famous, you can share news and ask questions on our website, thinkinglsat.com. This show is going to air on Monday, February 13th. Uh, that means Ben's free class is tonight. That's a mix of reading comprehension and logical reasoning. It's probably it's in the afternoon, but yeah. Mm hmm. Oh, sorry. In the afternoon. Uh, yeah. Oh, right. Actually, no. Well, I should say it again. It's in the morning if you're on the West Coast. It's 1 p.m. <laughs> Eastern, 10 p.m. Paci- 10 a.m. Pacific. That is Ben's class. It's a mix of reading comp and logical reasoning. Hopefully you've already heard about this and are coming because uh, it's later today. Anyway, you go to lsat.link forward slash Ben if you want to look at Ben's free classes. I have free classes every other Thursday, 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern. Uh, The next one coming up is Thursday, February 23rd. It's called LSAT Gimmicks That Are Holding You Back. Go to lsat.link forward slash Nathan to learn about that. You can go to lsatdemon.com forward slash classes if you want to look at all of our class offerings. Ready to uh, jump into this first news item? Yeah, this is big. This is big. Go for it. Yeah, it says ABA votes to keep law school standardized test requirement. The ABA's House of Delegates has twice rejected proposals to drop the LSAT or other tests. The change could still go into effect without House approval. ABA rules allow the House of Delegates to reject changes to the accreditation standards twice. After that, the Legal Education Council may push the changes through without the House's approval. (laughs) Okay, that's an odd caveat. So we just keep having news and not news and news and not news about this, right? Yeah. Okay. So like, I guess the quick recap is um, law schools are required to use an admissions test, not the LSAT, but an admissions test. For a long time, the only approved admissions test was the LSAT. Recently, the GRE has also been approved uh, for law school admissions and some schools have started to accept GREs in some circumstances. Yep. There's a committee that keeps recommending let's get rid of the uh, get rid of this testing requirement. Yep. But we had a dean from what was it like 80 law school deans or I can't remember what the number was. Maybe I'm inflating it. 60 law school deans. (laughs) All deans. (laughs) 60 deans. Hey, uh, Fagman has to count for like 10. Um, (laughs) So all these law school deans lined up to say, hey, you're basically going to make us racist if you don't let us use the LSAT. They they believe that the that the LSAT is a way to democratize uh, or to make it more egalitarian, at least, because mm-hmm. if we don't have this testing way to see, you know, to get diamonds in the rough, well, then, OK, so now you're not allowing us to use or <laughs> require. That's the irony, right, is that they can still use it if they want to use it. Yeah. But these deans are like, no, we want to be required to use it. Yeah, well, it provides cover, right, when people complain about it, and it prevents a race to the bottom, I guess, for some of these schools. Some schools, of course, will not be pressured by the lack of a requirement, but a lot of schools would be. They would just say, okay, great, we don't require the LSAT, now let's get more applicants, and boy, who knows what would happen. I mean, I guess, except people on the basis of things or factors that are even more subjective to um, bias. Well, like having gone to the right school and gotten the right grades as if that's not already biased for a thousand different reasons. Right. The reason why they started using a test in the first place is that they wanted to get rid of the old boys network. They wanted to get rid of this, you know, just nothing but nepotism and generation after generation after generation of the same families going to the right prep school, the right uh, university and getting the right grades. And then, well, of course, our doors are open to you at these elite halls of legal education. And a test allows mavericks, weirdos like me, you know, with bad undergraduate grades, first generation college student, never had any guidance, didn't think I was ever going to go to grad school terrible undergraduate grades but then 10 years later i pop for this huge lsat score and now it's like well you know what actually after all this guy who came from nowhere and didn't you know achieve anything in his undergraduate career when he was an idiot 19 year old guess what as a 29 year old he's now killing the lsat and applying to law school maybe we should give this guy a shot so 
I think, Ben, you are on the same page. Like, we understand that the LSAT itself has problems. Yeah. I mean, itself, it, it itself is a barrier for some people. The question is, is it more of a barrier or more of a barrier breaker? And we feel like on balance, it's more of a barrier breaker. Yeah, it's it's like one of those things where it's like, well, OK, yeah, it's not great. It's just the best thing we have. It's like democracy or capitalism. It's like, well, OK, fine. You don't like these things aren't purpose aren't perfect. Admittedly, they're not. Yeah. They got but what problems. else you yeah. want to do? What like really, what do you want to do here? And so <laughs> who knows now what's going to happen? Because now we've got like it's an internal fight in the ABA, right? It's a committee. Mm -hmm that mm -hmm. wanted to get rid of this testing requirement. But now the apparently the House of Delegates, whatever the hell that is, is <laughs> again shooting it down. And now there's a, still a higher court, I guess, which is that the council, what the legal education council, whatever the hell that is, they can go ahead and do whatever they want, apparently. So yeah, <laughs> we'll that see. is so confusing. What is the hierarchy of the ABA? It's like you have this yeah. committee that's clearly being overruled by the House of Delegates, which I would think is the final say or the final authority but apparently there's this higher authority the legal education council what maybe huh? it's like you can have a veto proof majority you know the president can veto a normal bill but if it passes with a certain margin or something who knows and honestly <laughs> who cares i, I gotta yeah. i mean look if they get rid of this requirement to use the lsat how many school or to use a test if we take the schools at their word, they believe that they like using the test yeah. and no one is ever telling them that they can't use the test. All we're arguing about is whether they are required to use the test. And <laughs> my core argument, which I haven't even said yet, is that the schools right now heavily weight the LSAT in law school admissions. That means they think it's useful to them. They're not doing that because they're required to. They're doing that because it's it's the most useful metric they have. That's why they weight it the most heavily. Yeah, and that's a little tough because it's is it useful for admitting the right applicants or is it useful for the ranking system, right? It's hard to parse that. Or out is it useful just because it's simple, right? It's yeah. the one numeric thing where you can really compare apples to apples. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. I mean, because grades, how can you compare an engineering major from like a good school to a criminal justice major from a run of the mill local school? Yeah, you can't. That's not reasonable to look at. Oh, well, that's a three point seven and that's a three point seven. So they're the same thing. No, they're not. They're, not, they're obviously not the same thing. Yeah. Whereas LSAT at least uh, seems like it's well, you're fighting on a level playing field. Well, even in your example, it's like a 3.7 versus a 3.7. You know that the one from the higher ranked school with engineering is better, but it gets complicated when it's a 3.9 from an easier major at a lesser known school to a 3.7 at a with a competitive, you know, a challenging major at a competitive school. And then you're just like, well, okay, at what point do these people start to balance out? It's it's very tough. If, and if nothing else, the LSAT gives them another piece of data, right? It's just another thing that they can easily use to check to see, you know, kind of reality check. If somebody yeah. comes to you with a 4.3 GPA from Easy A University, how mm -hmm. do you know what that's worth? Well, I don't know. It doesn't like conclusively tell you to look at their LSAT. But if you look at their LSAT and their LSAT's a 175, you go, hmm, maybe that 4.3 is legit. And yeah. if you look at their LSAT and their LSAT is a 155, you go, huh, that's interesting. Why, why didn't this person do better on this test if they're so good at school? And yeah. maybe they dig a little bit deeper in that case. Yeah. Anyway, we'll see. Keep the uh, news and comments coming, by the way. Go to thinkinglsat.com and let us know what you think about uh, all this stuff. Uh, we're going to do these rapid fire. Um, we'll just read them alternately, I guess. I'll do the first one. This is all uh, we had score release come out sure. uh, last week. And uh, so results from the January test. Peter says score release exclamation point. Hey, Ben and Nathan, I've been a demon premium user since last July. Today, I got back a 175 on the January LSAT exclamation point. I took the LSAT for the first time last October and got a 173, but I knew I had a few more points in me. I know you don't like thank you for my score messages. Is that true? Wait, what? Have we sent that vibe? <laughs> I, I mean, love getting thank you for my score messages. I don't know what yeah. I said that it made you think that. 
Anyway, Peter says, so instead, thank you for developing a set of methodologies that make the test easy and intuitive. Oh, I, I know said, what he's saying. We what? Every time people say thank you for my score or whatever, we always push back and say, well, you're the one who did the hard work. So oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank yeah. yourself, right? right. That's, um, that's And so he's saying, well, thanks for doing this other stuff. Okay, yeah, yeah. sure. No, a thousand percent, though. I mean, Peter, you, yeah. Okay, we made the resources for you, but you you definitely did the hard work to make that happen. You can't fake yeah. a 175. I mean, <laughs> We're still not going to accept your thank you for my score. Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah. Um, LSAT Demon was a genuinely enjoyable learning experience, says Peter. I plan to apply to law schools this fall, and it's wonderful to feel excited rather than scared. I have a 3.90 UGPA as well. So I'm optimistic about my options and I'm hoping I won't have to pay for law school. Thanks for planting that idea in my head as well. I just assumed I'd go into a bunch of debt, but no way I'm going to do that now. Cheers, Peter. Ben, do you ever feel like we don't do good for the world? I do sometimes, but not when I read a, an email like that. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> I was just thinking about this idea of planting an idea. Some ideas are extraordinarily powerful and... Uh, this is this is one that we've hit on, right? Don't pay for law school. It's an idea that is 100% true, but very hard for people to just automatically accept given everything that they hear otherwise or come to this game assuming, right? So yeah, hopefully at least planting that idea can set people in the right direction. Oh, if we can, yeah, if we spread the word that law schools give crazy amounts of merit-based scholarships... Mm -hmm. uh, I should put scare quotes around merit based scholarships. You know, they're essentially fighting for law school rankings, right? They want your LSAT, they want your GPA and they'll pay for it. If yeah. the numbers are right, they'll pay for it. Yep. And many, many people don't know that. If you'd like to learn more about that, go to lsatdemon.com forward slash scholarships and play around with our scholarship estimator a little bit. When you do that, make sure you click on the little PDF link next to the schools you're interested in, because that PDF link will take you directly to the, the source of the data, which comes from these 509 ABA, American Bar Association uh, 509 reports that show you, it's on the bottom of the second page, there's a little table down there for grants and scholarships. And if you're not already looking at that, then you're a sucker in the game, yeah. right? I mean, you're just, yeah. or you're not, you're not you're a sucker if you accept any offer. If you haven't looked at these 509s, you have to look at the 509s. So, again, lsatdemon.com forward slash scholarships. We have links to all the 509s, but you can also use our tool there as a shortcut to play with various LSAT and GPA combinations and see what kinds of scholarships you might be able to get. Uh, I want to say one more thing about this planting an idea thing. I, I got this idea from you. Uh, people when I meet people that I don't know or that I'm meeting for the first time or whatever, they often ask, what do you do? Right. And for years I said, I help people prepare for the LSAT. I help them do better on the LSAT. And you said, I help people go to law school for free. And so ever since you said that, I've been saying that to people. And of course, that's a way more interesting conversation starter than I help people prepare for the LSAT. First they are like, what is the LSAT? And then it's kind of like, oh, test prep yawn right but when i say oh i help people go to law school for free it never <laughs> uh stops there it's always yeah. like what I, they think i'm lying or they think it's huh what? what what do you mean and then you go no i literally help people save one hundred and fifty thousand dollars of loss for for law school Exactly. Literally. And that's what it's I do. not just one or two people i mean there are thousands of people in the demon and I hope a very high percentage of them are heeding our advice or at least saving way more than half of whatever it costs to go to their school. Um, anyways, yeah. Ideas. I think the only way we'll ever really know if we're successful is if law school tuitions start to come down, right? If if law schools ever do the uh, big adjustment, like some of those liberal arts colleges have recently yeah. done, yeah. and just all of a sudden like made their their tuition more realistic if they stop mm -hmm. giving these giant scholarships and instead charge half price you know they could right now easily at many schools they could just charge everybody half price mm -hmm. but that's not what they do they let half the people go for zero and they let half the people go for full price yeah and that's that's the thing that we're really complaining about you know so peter 
we have definitely helped Peter if if we have got that idea into his head that like, oh, hey, you do not have to impoverish yourself here. Yep. The thing I worry about is that all it means is that Peter now is going to take one of the scholarships and then somebody else who doesn't know is going to impoverish themselves. But I don't know what we can do. <laughs> you know, yeah. like we, we have to help one student at a time. So, well, we're in an interesting industry, right? In a lot of businesses, your customers keep coming back to you. I've heard something like um, for most businesses, 80 percent of their revenue is coming from repeat customers. Yeah, we don't have a lot of repeat customers. It's constantly a new crop of students coming in with the same flawed assumptions. It's almost like yeah. to really blanket the market space, we have to go earlier. <laughs> yeah. We have to like somehow, you know, get the idea down to younger generations. Or well, something. speaking I, of I that, know. I mean, if you are active in a pre-law society of any sort at your undergraduate institution, if you have a, uh, let's say you have a pre-law advisor who hasn't yet heard this message, which I think the majority of pre-law advisors have no clue that law schools play these games with tuition and scholarships. Yeah. Or they, they, they know they do. They know there are scholarships, but they believe the, the story that it's only to a very small select few. And that and you don't like have plan to on. write an essay and like, <laughs> oh, there's outside scholarships that you can apply for. But that's yeah. all bullshit. I mean, so that is true, but it's, it's smoke. It's you're hiding yes. things. It's a distraction. Yeah. And because the, the reality is, and you can look this up, you can check any school you're interested in, look at that 509 report and the, it's going to be right there in black and white. Does this school give a lot of full ride scholarships or not? Mm -hmm. And many schools are giving 10%, 20%, 30%, or higher of their class are getting a full ride at lots of schools. It's something like 80% of the class is getting some sort of a grant. Yes. I mean, we've seen some where it says 99, 99% of the class is getting some sort some of a sort tuition of discount. Yeah. yeah. And so like if you have a pre-law advisor who doesn't understand that, maybe you can share this podcast with them. Maybe you can have them talk to us. Like we, we really do want to do good for the world. I, I have this vision in my head of what I don't want to be. And mm. what I don't want to be is there's a long line of people waiting to get into law school. And I somehow have this magic velvet rope where I'm picking people out of the line, you know, my people. And yeah. I'm like, hey, you guys, you get to come up to the front of the line. If that's all I'm doing, then I feel like I'm not helping anybody, really. You know, it, all I mean, I'm helping the individuals, I guess, but at the expense of all the other people who are in the line. And so yeah. I don't I don't like that feeling. But on the other hand, if if there's some potential that we're actually going to be able to change this system then I start feeling very good about it, right? If if more and more people are like savvy, if more and more people realize what the schools are doing, I think eventually there might be some kind of a refusal because that's all we're doing really, right? Peter is going to refuse to pay for law school. Yes. So and we so want that's more people. to force, yeah, the schools to change eventually. But you need a critical number to continue your analogy. Yeah, these people are waiting in line and there's this red velvet velvet. <laughs> what is that called? It's I guess a rope or something. Yeah. Velvet yeah, rope. yeah. It's you're standing on the side of that line and you're yelling at people. And so this are a club bunch is of too other fucking expensive. <laughs> yeah, Don't they're... go to this club. It sucks. <laughs> and some people are looking at you and say, that guy's a dick. <laughs> Don't listen to him. <laughs> well, I mean, but I but I'm also I guess what I'm really doing is I'm saying this club has a separate admission process for people who get the right LSAT score. This you yeah. can go through that door that you're waiting in line and desperately hoping to get in and pay full price. But there's a much easier door. Do you see the giant open, wide open door over here? You don't even have yeah. to wait in that line. You can go yeah. this way and you can waltz right in for free. Mm -hmm. You know, the wrecking ball uh, has bashed a hole in the door of the club and you can go in the wrecking ball door. Yeah. You know, uh, just back to your advice to share resources with um, pre-law advisors. I mean, it'd be great if they listened to our podcast, but... 
I have this feeling that's going to be um, unlikely. So I think the best resource is the scholarship estimator. Just tell them True. to search for it. LSAT Demon scholarships and start playing around with that. Because the 509 reports are right there. The evidence for what we're saying is backed up there. Like start see start seeing the numbers. Yeah, and send that link to your pre-law advisor. Send that link to your parents. Send that yeah. link to the lawyer at your firm who is telling, you know, who's trying to give you advice about law school admissions. Before yep. you let them give you advice about law school admissions, maybe do a little reality check and see how much they actually know about law school admissions. Yeah. It, what we have found over now, boy, between the two of us, Ben, I think we're approaching three decades. Whoa. Wait, we're already over three decades between the two of us, I think. Yeah. Uh, we have a lot of experience in this and our experience tells us that your parents or whatever lawyers you might know, the people at your firm and your pre-law advisors and your undergraduate professors, yep, they just don't really know how the game is played. They don't, they don't understand this thing about the scholarships. Yep. You want to read this next, uh, email from Spencer? Yep. The subject is thank you, exclamation point, exclamation point. Hi, exclamation point. My name is Spencer. Uh, I'm a junior at Cornell University and just took the January LSAT. I prepped using LSAT Demon Basic and got a 176. Wow. wow. Nice work. You designed such a user-friendly website that made me really want, and that has asterisks around it, want to study. I would sometimes procrastinate other responsibilities by studying because I genuinely found it fun. I have been telling everyone to use the demon exclamation point. Hey, Spencer, that's really good to hear. Um, you know, it's funny. Procrastinating other responsibilities may not always be a good thing, but when it comes to the LSAT, boy, a lot of times people don't realize it's outsized influence and how it may be actually more important than other things you're juggling <laughs> in terms of the impact it's going to have on your future. So yeah, if it's not like the health and safety of your child or yes. <laughs> um, making sure that your, your rent gets paid there, you know, like, cause if we start talking about your shitty job, your shitty job doesn't pay nearly as much as you might be able to pay yourself by getting, you know, a really killer LSAT score. Like a 176. Yeah. Yeah. Like Spencer and her 176. Yeah. If, if you, um, if you were to, uh, neglect your job duties and get fired, but also improve your LSAT by 10 points or along the way, you're still in the black. Big time. I think you're solidly in the black. Yeah. Yeah. Richie says, subject, score increase. Hi, Ben and Nathan. Big fan of the podcast here. I'm writing this to let you guys know that my score jumped from a 151 to a 167 in my most recent LSAT attempt. I used the LSAT Demon for about three months, studying about two to five hours a day, and I can't stop recommending the program to others. Thanks again, and keep up the amazing work. Best, Richie. Okay. So not a 170 yet for Richie, but a uh, nice 16 point improvement there. Well, uh, Richie also says in my most recent attempt, it almost sounds like Richie's going to take it again, which would be That's what great. I was thinking too. Yeah. Yeah. Keep going. Law schools only care. Here's the other thing that all of these people in your life probably don't know about law school admissions or frequently don't know about law school admissions, that law schools only care about your highest score in the United yep. States. There are a couple schools in Canada that would average your scores. But in the United States, the high LSAT that you have on your record is what matters. So the second Richie got a 167, Richie's 151 is no longer even relevant. Like the school will see it, but the schools won't care because nobody else will see that number. When they report Richie to the American Bar Association, they, all they have to report is that 167. So why does anybody give a shit anymore about the 151? And truth is they don't. Yeah. Anonymous says, hello, Ben and Nathan, exclamation point. I want to thank y'all for encouraging me, encouraging me to retake my 171. I was the last emailer on Get Greedy with Your LSAT Score, which is apparently episode 346. I just got my score back from January, and it was a 174, low end of my practice score range, but I think that is enough for me to be content with submitting this coming September in the 2023-2024 cycle. Your podcasts are a hoot, 
And I love the smart ass commentary. If only you guys did your personal statement critique still. Ha ha. Well, Anonymous, you're in luck, actually, because we are going to do a personal statement oh, in we are. today's show. <laughs> yes, wow. we are. Wow, we, we, don't, we do not do these anymore. But one correspondent uh, took our advice, I think, to the extreme. And so I thought it might be a good PSA to say, hey, there's a lot here that we like, but there's some stuff you you need you need to maybe dial it back a tiny bit. So we'll, that'll be later in the show. Please don't submit your personal statement to the show. We're not going to read it. Uh, we used to do it, but it was too depressing. <laughs> but uh, once in a while, by popular demand, we might uh, throw one on the show. I don't know if we're ever going to recreate the man with the kind eyes. Well, that will never be defeated. humor. Yeah, no, <laughs> yeah, you can Google it. If you, the man with the kind eyes was definitely the pinnacle. Uh, this is interesting. I mean, I'm I'm glad you're happy with your 174. One thing to keep in mind is if you have a free Saturday or Friday or whatever where you can take the test again, uh, there's not going to be any harm and maybe some potential benefit for taking it between now and September. Anonymous, you could just do it as a, you know, just do it for fun. Because if you win and you go higher than a 174, that's going to help you. If you go lower, meh, doesn't matter. And that's a big three points already, though, for Anonymous. I mean, yeah. the difference between 174 and 171 is not nothing. Yep. Nice work. This next um, piece is a, is a snippet from a New York Times article that I read on Thursday, February 2nd, 2023. And... <laughs> I don't know. I just kind of found it unbelievable. So I'm I'm really putting it on here to ask the audience whether anyone has even heard of this idea. Um, and once they hear it from us, whether they'd even take it seriously. The title is The Teenager Leading the Smartphone Liberation Movement. Subtitle Logan Lane gave up her smartphone that changed her life. I have this stuck out to me partly because I have a love-hate relationship with my phone. I need it for all sorts of things, but absolutely hate also the amount of distraction it introduces into my life. And I don't really use it in the way so many people often do for social media and whatnot. It still is just a source of distraction. Anyways, here's the piece of the article that I, I clipped here. It says, the idea of reclaiming any degree of independence from our smartphones can often feel impossible, for the 17-year-old Logan Lane, the solution was to quit cold turkey. Lane grew up in Brooklyn and was a screen-addicted teenager who spent hours curating her social media presence on Instagram and TikTok. Then, a little over two years ago, Lane started questioning whether living a life of constant connection was actually a good thing and made the decision to ditch her smartphone altogether. She began assembling a Luddite club, a group of teenagers who reject technology and its creeping hold on all of our lives. So apparently there are people who do this. I, it just, it does feel impossible to me. Um, have you heard of this at all? It sounds like bullshit to me, honestly. It sounds like uh, performative. You know, this is somebody who was on Instagram and TikTok for her whole life. And then, um, you know, decided that the way to get famous was actually to cut that cord <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, yeah. I, I don't know, whatever. I'm a cynic. It sounds like bullshit in today's media environment. Something like that seems dumb. It, it's, it seems dumb. The phone is a super valuable tool. Are you kidding me? You really don't want all the world's information in your pocket. Now, if the idea is leave your phone at home, sometimes I think that's a great idea. Yeah. Well, that's the thing is it's very hard to, I don't think you can get rid of your phone, but I'm just curious what ways people have of mitigating its influence. Leaving it at home every now and then is great, but it also creeps back, right? A lot of this is deleting apps that you find distracting. I, yeah, I, I want to go back to my number one tip. Um, if you're on an iPhone, you can you can go to settings and then you have to, they hide this, which means that's how you know it's good. OK, they, they don't want you to use this. Mm -hmm. You go to general settings yep. sorry no sorry you go to settings then you go to then general. you go nope you don't you go to oh. accessibility mm. then you scroll down to display or sorry it's up at the top display and text size then you have to scroll down to color filters but 
color filters, you can do this. So here's my phone in normal. Yep. Mm -hmm. With a and bunch of pencils. And then you can yeah. click this button and it changes it to that. Yeah. Um, I learned this from my, she was 14 years old niece at the time. And she was like, yeah, have you ever done that? Well, yeah, if you feel like you're getting too addicted to your phone, you can turn it into grayscale like that and it'll make your phone less appealing. Yeah. Where did she get that idea? I hope she got it from a teacher. And I hope that teacher is telling every single one of those kids that this is a thing that you could do and something that, you know, even if you don't do it, it's worth thinking about. Mm -hmm. When I when I catch myself mindlessly scrolling and I, I like end up mindlessly scrolling on like dumb sports news websites kind of stuff. Mm, yeah. If I find myself just looking for entertainment on the internet, then I, I, I know that it's time to give myself a little shot of that grayscale <laughs> because yeah. the candy colored dopamine bomb that is your, that is the, you know, standard iPhone motif yeah. Yeah. is not I don't think that's uh, that I that I have a problem with. So like the functionality of the phone being able to, you know, get emergency help if you need it, being able yeah. to use Apple Pay, being able to, um, you know, have your ID and your medical information and all of the world's information via Google and your email. And yeah. I mean, there's so much useful stuff. Right. But you all you could, though, also maybe dial down the uh brain candy part of it yeah i i hear two two practical ideas coming out of this conversation one turning on grayscale more often than not and two really getting comfortable leaving your phone somewhere even if it's just for an hour because people are addicted right you're like feeling hey is my phone on me it's like come on Let's there is a go. step in between, even a step in between that, which is turning it off. Mm -hmm. Many people are like, you know, they'd never, ever turn their phone off. Yeah. Yeah. That's a move that I should do more often, you know, because yeah. then even if I grab it out of my pocket to check the time or whatever, mm. I'm, it'll be off and I'll go, oh, right. I'm not that I don't, who gives a what? I don't need to look at the internet right now. Yeah. Okay. I don't, that's about all I have to say, I think about yep. that. Cora says, hey, Ben and Nathan, I have been an, a demon member since December. I started my LSAT journey using in November with little to no progress. Uh, maybe uh, Eric will bleep out the name of that book. Then found the Thinking LSAT podcast and became a member shortly after. My diagnostic was a 147 and I'm up about 10 points so far. I'm super proud of my progress, but I feel like I'm in a rut and I wanted some advice. I'm a cheerleader at NC State University. And I'm also on the U.S. national cheerleading team. If you don't know much about high level college cheer, I'm going to assume you don't because not many people do. Oh, how wrong you are, Cora. I practice three to five <laughs> days a week for three hours, have two hour long workouts and around two basketball games to cheer every week. Yes, I know that uh, cheer, especially at the college or um, yeah, national levels, I totally know. And what did you ever see that little documentary that was out a while back? Uh, there was like a show that was all about. Yeah. Yeah. Cheer. I didn't see it, but I, I saw ads for it. It was kind of fun. I don't know. Yes. It's understand that It's like anything competitive, right? You can. Yeah. It's like a just, lot to it. Well, it's gymnastics. Yeah. yeah. You know, um, it's an athletic endeavor for sure. OK. So anyway, uh, needless to say, I have little time to devote to the LSAT. I made my class schedule this year to only have to go to campus on Mondays and Wednesdays in order to devote time on Tuesdays, Thursdays and Fridays to LSAT prep, but I'm really struggling to find the time to take full length tests and go to the classes that the demon provides. I'm getting in a full practice test each week. Okay, well, there's your problem. Oh, wait, sorry, doing LR and RC on Tuesday and LG on Thursday. So it's actually not a full length. I mean, you're not doing it all in one sitting, you're dividing it up, but we, we actually recommend that you divide it up. So that's great. I don't like this next part. Oh, reviewing on Friday. Yeah, that's bad. I would much rather you do that LR section on Tuesday and then immediately review that LR section on Tuesday. Yeah. So stop doing a full test every week. Just do two sections a week. Eventually you'll do a full test. You'll catch up after two weeks. But do the review before you do another section. Yeah. Do LR, then review it on Tuesday. And then on Thursday, do RC and then review it. 
and then yeah on friday do games and then review it and then yeah well there you go she's doing it in the in the the most painful way because she's doing the whole test then on friday she has to review the whole test Ugh, which yeah. that sucks because you're spending all this time on the ones that you missed and instead if you had done a section, you know, presumably you're going to be successful on many of those questions and feel pretty good about that. The ones that you missed, you're going to review them thoroughly to make sure you understand them. And then it's like, you know, brush off and take a nap and get up tomorrow and do do the process again instead of just wallowing in like a full test worth of mistakes. Look, your two wrecking balls inside of your prep are timed sections and drilling precisely because when you do them, you can review immediately after and you can review immediately after more so even in drilling. That doesn't mean that drilling is better because timed sections have their advantages. You can practice ignoring the clock. You can practice the same sort of setup that you're going to have when you're taking the official test. That said, when you have a really busy schedule, Cora, you, you you can't be sidelining drilling to when you have time. Just mix up time sections and drilling. Maybe you do time section a time section on Tuesday and then on Thursday you do a bunch of drilling. So you can get that immediate feedback. There's a reason not very many people touch hot stoves every day. It's because when they do, they immediately know that feels painful and that's a stupid move. When you do something on Tuesday and then you don't review it until Friday, you're putting this huge disconnect between what you're doing and what you're learning from it. If anything, you, you, you often probably don't even remember why you chose the answer you chose. And then it's just this, I don't know, post game analysis after everyone's forgotten what happened. And it's just not effective. Cora continues. Uh, she says, I know if I had more time, I would be able to increase my score even more. My goal score is in the high 160s or 170 if I can pull it out. And I'm planning to apply this August and September. For context, I have a 3.8 GPA and would like to attend a top 25 school. I'm signed up for the February test and I'm planning to take the June test. I am unable to take both the March and April tests because I will be at training for the national team. Uh, the test only takes a few hours. You really can't schedule that. Like the training is all of March, all of April, 24 hours a day. I think sometimes students think that if they're not actively studying for the LSAT every day, then that means that they can't take the LSAT. But I I don't like this bracketing of like taking the fit. I mean, she's already taking it officially, is she? Well, she's going to take the February test, which she may or may not be ready for. Oh, she says she's only up. She's up 10 points from her 147. Yeah. If she wants in the 160s, uh, Cora, I don't think you have any business taking the February test. No, I, I think the problem here all stems from the fact that she's She's a go-getter. She's doing all these things. And on top of that, trying to apply this August, September. Give up on that goal. Yeah. yeah. Well, right. I mean, and she's going to hate that advice, but it's like, hey, Cora, you might have too much going on to really be able to put your best foot forward by September. Give yourself an extra year and now score in the mid 170s and yeah. make your 3.8 super happy and your career yeah. as a cheer cheerleader. Yeah. Take a gap year or two. She might already be, if she's a senior, you know, she might already be looking at one gap year and she, but sometimes people think that two gap years is too much, but it's just not. I mean, if it means that you end up applying with the 170 that you are capable of instead of the 160 that you're currently not even capable of, it's a wildly different start to your legal career. You know, you just it will change your life on a different mm -hmm. trajectory. Yeah, it would completely change your life. Um, I'd be happy to talk to like your parents about it. We have a class coming up called Parents Night. Mm. <laughs> it's one of my free classes. It actually is already available. You can register for it. It's March 9th uh, at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern. It's explicitly for your parents, uh, you know, your pre-law advisors, whoever you want to bring. It's going to be about how law school scholarships work. 
the power of the LSAT, what the LSAT's actually testing, how the demon approaches the test, and our GLAD method for law school applications. Uh, we would love to see your folks there. If, if you've got folks pressuring you to start law school right now, we would love to try to help them understand that your whole entire just future it could be way better if you take another, take some more time. Because people don't think about it that way, right? Here's, here's what Cora says. Should I take a break after I finish the February test, then come back to studying later? Or should I continue to fill Tuesdays and Thursdays with LSAT sections and hope that I have an extra 30 minutes to drill the other days of the week? I'm curious what your advice would be because I'm beginning to feel stuck in the 155 to 157 range and know that if my circumstances were different, I would be doing substantially better. Sorry for the obscenely long email. Thank you in, advi in advance for the advice. I know y'all will be tremendously helpful. Cora. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think, Cora, that you really want to take the February test. I think you should probably push that. My preference would be for Cora to focus on her cheer and her grades. She has a 3.8, but is, are you getting straight A's this semester? Well, I mean, yeah, because if you can make it even a 3.81 by getting straight A's this semester. Sorry, Ben, go ahead. Yeah, I, I would just say, like, enjoy the journey enjoy life yeah. you're you're doing things that are fun and exciting to you continue to crush it in school but maybe crush it even more focus on cheer do your best you can there have some time for yourself and your friends finish school then turn your focus to the lsat and you'll have a year to do what you think you can do you i mean you're saying if my circumstances were different, I would be doing substantially better. Okay. Your circumstances can easily change by simply giving up on this goal to apply in August, September. I think even if you try and you don't give up on that goal, you say, no, I hate that idea. I'm going to apply in August. I, I think you're forcing yourself to apply with a lower score because you're not going to be ready for February. If you take it in March and April, it sounds like you're going to be stressed by other activities yeah. So you're not going to do great there. You might take it in June. Maybe. Yeah. You know, you're Cora, you're writing to us for law school admissions advice. And you started with a couple long paragraphs or sorry, one long paragraph about the thing that you're passionate about right now, which is cheer. Uh, if any part of what you're doing for cheer is because you think it's going to be good for law school admissions, please reconsider that. I mean, because honestly, if you are insisting upon applying this September and if law school admissions was the only thing that we cared about, again, if you insist on applying this September, which I don't know is going to be right for you, Cora, but if, if you did insist on applying this September, I might encourage you to quit cheer. Yep. Because you're, you're mildly neglecting the two most important things, which are LSAT and GPA. I just looked up the 509 report for Alabama, which is um, exactly the 25th ranked school in the country. Alabama is reporting a 50th percentile UGPA of 3.95. So Cora, you know, you've, you've done great things with your cheer career and that's awesome. But all that, as far as law schools are concerned, it's like, well, that's going to make for an interesting personal statement. And sure, you know, it's a feather in your cap. But again, Alabama's median LSAT is 166 and their median GPA is 3.95. I think at this point in your college career, the ship has sailed on 3.95. It's actually not even possible for you to get a 3.95 anymore. And so like you're going to be a splitter at Alabama if if you're going to get in to Alabama, you're going to be a splitter there with a high LSAT. And I, I hate to be insulting a 3.8, but like if you're talking about competing in elite academia, which is what the top 25 law schools are, 3.8 is not an elite GPA. So you've you've not been good enough at school to justify getting into these schools. And right now you're not good enough at the LSAT because you you've been spending so much time on extracurriculars. And again, for your life, I'm not telling you to quit cheer at all. In fact, what I'm really telling you, I think, is to quit the LSAT for now. Focus on your grades, finish up cheer, graduate probably, 
then come back and study the LSAT and just push law school for another year to make sure that your ducks really are in a row. Yep. And you're, you're going to, you're going to kill it. Yeah. You can totally kill it, but not this way. I mean, not, not by dividing your attention so many ways. Yeah. You got three things going on right now, school, LSAT and cheer, and you can't do all three. You can't be excellent at all three. You just don't have enough hours in the day. And you don't need to be. Right. <laughs> you could just be excellent at cheer and school right now. Yep. And then be excellent at the LSAT after you're done being excellent at those things. Yep. Thanks, Thanks. Cora. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what's Diana have to say? Hello, Ben and Nathan. I've been studying with the demon since late November of 2022. My diagnostic was a 154 and my last practice test was a 165 exclamation point. I feel like I am really beginning to understand the test I am, and I am much less afraid of it than before. I'm so glad I found your podcast and service. You both have totally changed my mind about paying for law school. I plan on taking the official LSAT when I start scoring in the high 170s. I've listened to many of your podcasts, so I know your, that your advice is to apply on the day the applications open. What should we do, though, if a school has rolling admissions? Should we still apply in August or September? All law schools have rolling admissions. Yeah, we're saying apply on the day the applications open. The day because, rolling admissions open. Yes, because, because they have rolling admissions. Because That's precisely just, why. why. Yeah. yeah. I, this is funny because it sounds like a conversation that Diana might have had with a law school where yeah. like where Diana was like, well, I want to when do your applications open? Because I want to apply on the first day. And the school is like, oh, well, we do rolling admissions. Our applications are still yeah. open for last cycle. You could apply yeah. right now for last cycle. So I don't know why, you know, why would you want to apply on the day it opens? <laughs> we like, still we're going to accept them until June. So, I mean, like, right. just, yeah, get because, it in. <laughs> right. Yeah. Rolling admissions means that the law schools open up on September 1st or whatever it is. And then they just keep accepting applications until they have enough suckers to pay tuition. Yep. You know, and so when a school is still accepting applications in June, that means Ooh. that they haven't found enough suckers yet. Yep. And that's a really bad sign. Yeah. Another really, really bad sign is when they have bullshit like priority early registration <laughs> deadlines that in are March. in like April or May. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> That's like, wait a second. That is not early by any stretch of the imagination. All of the top law schools have long closed their admissions window and you're still out here. Really? You're still out here fishing for brand new applicants at this point in the cycle. It's a, just a clear sign that you're dealing with uh, not one of the elite institutions. Yeah. Uh, Diana continues, or should we apply as soon as we get an amazing LSA score and possibly start during their spring semester? Ugh. Nope. Well, just get your best possible score and then apply in September. I mean, or maybe like what we'd have to talk about what school is this exactly? And do they give scholarships for people who start during the spring semester? I mean, most schools don't do that. But the schools that do do that, we'd have to look at the processes individually and see like, oh, I mean, hey, do they make you an offer or do they not? Well, the only problem I have with that, though, still is that even if you can go for yeah. free to a school like this, you're not um, aware of what you could have gotten at yeah. so many other schools that aren't doing that. Right. Yeah, so some local school ropes you in with a full ride to start in their spring semester. Meanwhile, you could have gone to an actual like prominent national real you know <laughs> school well yeah just a, you know and that school might have also given you a scholarship right you don't know if you don't if you don't apply broadly early in the cycle then you really don't know what your value might have been if you had yep she continues thank you again for your help i don't think my score would have risen so much without the demon and i'm excited to break into the 170s I know I can do it now with the LSAT demon since my GPA is not stellar, 3.58. Getting a score in the high 170s would completely change the caliber of schools that will accept me and even give me money to go there. I hope to write follow-up emails when I take my official LSAT, apply to schools, and see that scholarship money roll in, exclamation Great. point. Yeah, thank you, Diana. We hope the same for you. Yeah, until law schools change their behavior... You know, until they start doing this predatory thing of 
giving full rides to the people who have really good LSAT and GPA and charging full price to the people who have the worst LSAT and GPA. We don't think that that's really what they should be doing. We think that they should be charging everybody a fair price for the product. Yeah. Uh, until they change their behavior, you really shouldn't be trying to get into law school. You should be trying to get scholarships to law school. That's your goal. Getting in is nothing. Getting in is easy. Yeah. Getting scholarships is the thing that, that really matters. Yeah. Thanks, Diana. Sorry, really quick. Diana's email made me think about the GLAD acronym that you mentioned earlier. So that, that means to, when we say apply with our <laughs> GLAD approach, first focus on your GPA, yep. then a focus on your LSAT score, then apply early and apply broadly. Those are two critical elements because yep. if you apply early to one school, well, then you're still subject to that one school. If you apply late, broadly, you're still giving up potential offers that you would have had otherwise. And then finally, make a decision after you get the offers. People are always making decisions before, like, oh, this is where I'm gonna go. And it's like, you don't know where you should go until you see the final numbers. But I guess <laughs> I, I want to expand our GLAD acronym, um, or is that an initialism? What is it? Um, no, it's an acronym, because it's a word. <laughs> Sounds oh, like a okay. word. Yeah, yeah, I got it, okay. So I want to I want to say glad like there's two A's in there, right? Like I don't want people uh, to glad because yeah, <laughs> apply early and apply broadly. Yeah, I don't want I people to forget that. I don't want people to say, oh, yeah, OK, apply. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, we're saying a twice because you need to do both of those things. That's the only way you're going to find out what you really were worth that cycle. Yep. Uh, if you apply to fewer schools, if you don't apply early, if you don't apply with your best LSAT, then Good luck, but you know, you're just, you're not, it's like you're fishing with one pole instead of fishing with eight poles and a net. Yeah. And you're fishing in the fall rather than in the winter when all the fish have gone <laughs> down deeper where the water's warmer. I like it. Yeah. Thanks, Diana. Eddie says, I've gotten my hands dirty in 509 reports recently, which has given me a much clearer picture for projected law school costs. I'm attacking, attaching a tracker I made for the schools I applied to. Okay. It's color coded. Looks like 24 applications. Okay. Color coded for red schools. Eddie is below both LSAT and GPA median mm -hmm. at the orange schools. Eddie is at or above the LSAT at the yellow schools. Eddie is at or above GPA and at the green schools. Eddie is at or above both. Okay, cool. So at or above Rutgers, Texas, William and Mary, Northeastern, Boston University, Boston College, Miami, Michigan, George Washington. And then, uh, yeah, yellows for Virginia, UCLA, Duke, Vanderbilt, Northwestern, Reds for Wash U, Penn, Chicago, Harvard, NYU, Stanford. Okay. Eddie has also put in columns for tuition and fees, living expenses, total of tuition and fees and living expenses. Oh, percent receiving grants and then broken down into less than half, half to full. Yep. Full plus projected cost. Okay. And then real cost at the, at the end. Mm -hmm. for the schools that have uh given a scholarship yeah and that's that's important i'm glad you're doing that eddie because we want to know what we're going to pay not what we're quote unquote air quotes going to get in terms of scholarship yeah oh okay and there are some decisions on here too so rejected from chicago accepted at Rutgers, William and Mary, Northeastern, Miami, Michigan with a scholarship, GW. OK, cool. Um, yeah. If you're interested, I can send along an updated chart after I receive the rest of my offers. I'm also all ears. If you notice any flaws in my methods, all the best, Eddie. What do you think, uh, Ben? Does, does Eddie need to do anything here or is this uh, pretty legit? I think the fact that Eddie has the real costs and is keeping track of all this information. I mean, this is more than we encourage people to track, but 
uh, I don't have any problem with it. Eddie is done taking the LSAT <laughs> and now Eddie is in negotiation mode. So being aware of all this is going to make it easier for Eddie to know his real worth and yeah. make a decision. The, the, the most important column here, Eddie, is the real cost, which you will get after you get accepted and get offers. And you can know which school is to ask for more money because you'll know what it's going to cost you. Yeah. One thing that I might, I just, I think it's worth considering that the living expenses, on the one hand, they're not that different from school to school. On the other hand, to the extent that they are different, it's probably worth it. Or at least in my book, like the places that I like to be, the places that I like to live. Yeah. Um, and especially if you're thinking about settling down somewhere near where you went to law school, like it looks like the most expensive place to live here is uh, Stanford University lists a uh, living expenses of forty six thousand dollars. But I mean, it's also in the nicest place in the world, Palo Alto, you know. And so is it more expensive to live there? Yeah. Atherton. Yes, it's yeah. expensive to live in Atherton. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but, well, Palo Alto itself. I mean, I grew <laughs> yeah, up there and or anywhere. I went back and I was like blown away by yeah. all that's changed since Facebook and Google have surrounded that area. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so, yes, it's expensive. And yes, it's expensive to live in Cambridge. And yes, it's expensive to live in New York City. And yes, it's expensive to live in Chicago and Los Angeles. But also, those are the best places to live, at least for me. And you're likely to end up there, right? So yeah. And so I guess I like if I was really I don't maybe if I was doing it, I would actually take out the living expenses from the from the and I would just assume, hey, look, I understand that I'm going to have to pay rent. I'm going to have to buy food. I'm going to have to have transportation, whatever. And yes, I understand that some places are a little bit more expensive to live, but I don't think I would let the expense of living in Palo Alto scare me away from going to Stanford. In fact, I absolutely would not. No, that's a good point. And, you know, I'm going through this right now with one of my kids because he's applying to colleges and we're taking the living expenses estimates from those schools to figure out what it's going to cost to live there. But you have to realize that these are just estimates and what you ultimately decide to do, where you live, who you live with, all these things can change these numbers dramatically in one direction or the other. So maybe you can mitigate some of the cost increases of going to Palo Alto by living in a studio or something doing uh, yeah, something oh, different than what they're suggesting. Right. Yeah. So you don't have to follow these numbers. Well, um, for, for you yeah, and, and by commuting somewhat, right. I'm yeah. now noticing that Northeastern law lists their living expenses as $19,300 a year, while mm. Harvard law lists their living expenses as $35,000 a year. Mm. Well, those schools are both in Boston or, I mean, Northeastern's in Boston and Harvard's in Cambridge, but the Charles River separates those two and it's a bridge that you could walk across. That's a huge so, difference. Yeah. Yeah. Like, is it really $16,000 more expensive living expenses to go to Harvard? No, because you can live in Jamaica Plain and commute to Harvard. Yeah. Uh, so that Eddie, maybe you want to consider, is this even real? Because, yeah, Boston University is also listing only $20,892. Boston University is actually within visual distance of Harvard. Like you can look across the river and see Harvard hmm. so or see Cambridge from from BU. So there's no way that it's actually $15,000 different in living expenses. Or like, do you have to buy a fancy suit or something to go to Harvard? <laughs> I don't know. Good Next point. one. Yep. This is from Anonymous. The subject is advice for a splitter applicant. Ben and Nathan, I have an overall GPA of 2.7 and an LSAT score of 176. I plan on submitting applications to law school this fall with the goal to start fall of 2024. I will be submitting an addendum for my academic record. Undergrad is in nursing. What would you recommend? Do I apply to bottom feeder schools only because of my dumpster fire GPA? And then transfer out after completion of the first year or apply to some decent regional schools as well. I don't want to hurt my chances of transferring out in the future, but torn on how wide I want to cast my application net. Thank you for the input. Well, that's interesting. Um, generally, we don't encourage people to transfer because or to plan on transferring 
Because if you didn't do well in undergrad, your chances of doing well at an even more challenging <laughs> yeah. academic institution seems unlikely. So a lot of times I think people go in saying, oh, the LSAT's hard for me, so I'm going to use transferring to get to a higher school. Now, thankfully, Anonymous did very well on the LSAT, but Anonymous, your weakness is grades. A lot of people who are planning on transferring are planning to transfer because they did well with their GPA, but they couldn't cut it with the LSAT. And so they're hoping to sneak in with a GPA from law school. I mean, the numbers that we have right now suggest you're not going to have the best GPA in law school. I hope you do much better than you did. And it sounds like you're planning on doing so, but. But the competition is going to be way heavier. Yeah. than it was when you were an undergrad. So. So, yeah. And it's real easy for people to say, oh, well, that was different. That's not me. I'm a different person now. And maybe you are. And I hope that's true. I mean, because you need to do better than a 2.7, hopefully, <laughs> in law school. But yeah. But I mean, yeah, I know that I am bad at school. I'm, I'm smart as shit and I'm terrible at school. <laughs> like, I don't like it. I'm not good yeah. at it. Yeah. I don't like to sit in lectures. I don't like to take notes. I don't like to do homework. Yep. I don't like to memorize things I don't want to memorize. I'm bad at school. I, it's not it's not for me. I'm good at tests, but I'm terrible at school. So yeah, I had a 2.54 and a 179, but there was no way that, that I was going to be able to transfer out of Hastings to a better school because I wasn't, I'm not good at school. And for a whole year of intense a academic competition with these killers, I wasn't going to be at the top of the class. Yeah. I mean, when you transfer, you're going to need to kill it that first semester in an environment you've never been in before. Um, I don't think your, your odds of, and, and by kill it, I mean, you need to be in the top 10%, top 5% of your class. Why else would another law school pick someone up from a lower ranked law school, unless they're the best of the best of that law school? To make that clear to yourself, Anonymous, you can look at the 509 report of these decent regional schools, whatever these schools that you think you would like to transfer to, but they're not going to admit you, um, look at their 509s and see if they're actually taking transfers from any of these bottom feeder schools that you're proposing to start at. My guess yeah. is that they take not very many of them, possibly zero of them, possibly just one or two of those transfers per year. And yeah, that's going to mean that if you go to bottom feeder law, we should make sweatshirts, bottom feeder law. That'd be awesome. Um, <laughs> if we, if you went to bottom feeder law and trying to transfer, I mean, it, it might be impossible or virtually impossible for you to actually do this transfer. I, th I think you want to apply very broadly is what I'm saying. I think you want to apply to the bottom feeders and to these regional schools. Don't apply until you have your best LSAT. Oh, you already do with 176. Look, I think with a 176, you're also underselling yourself. I mean, yeah, uh, I, I just put them in, I just put them in, uh, put your numbers into the scholarship estimator. So that's lsatdemon.com forward slash scholarships. And I put in your 2.7 and your 176. And right now it's estimating that you could get a full tuition scholarship at Iowa. That's ranked 28th in the nation. It's not a bottom feeder. Um, and you're going for free. There's a few other schools here. Arizona, full tuition. Arizona is ranked 45 in the nation. Um, and then once you get down to like Penn State Dickinson, which is 58th in the nation, you got full tuition. Wayne State is full tuition. Southern Methodist is full tuition. Baylor is full tuition. You can go for free at decent schools. Yeah. The, the bottom feeder schools, you might apply to one or two of them just to see what they do. But I, I think, yeah, it seems like you've got reason, reasonable schools to apply to. And you could apply to some of these other schools that are more than half, like George Mason. More than half just means they give somewhere between half and full, just not full. So who knows what numbers you might get back there at a 176. They may say, ugh, we don't like your 2.7, but we love your 176. And once, once you're below their median GPA, who cares whether you have a 2.7 or a 3.1? Yeah. It's not pulling down yeah. their median GPA anymore. <laughs> So, well, I don't think they're ranked on their 25th percentile either, right? They don't care how no. low their 25th percentile is. It seems like they yeah. don't care. Yeah. Yeah. 
So really your 176 could be very valuable at some schools that happen to need high LSAT scores that application cycle. So apply broadly and a year from now, we'll be looking at your apps the way we were looking at Eddie's apps earlier. And, uh, you know, it's, it's even too early for Eddie really to be looking because half of Eddie's decisions aren't in yet. So, yep. you know, we, for you anonymous, we need to be having this conversation like 14 months from now, uh, this fall, you need to apply really broadly, go to lsatdemon.com forward slash scholarships to figure out what schools you want to apply to. Yeah. Let's wrap it up with, uh, Nathaniel's personal statement. Okay. You want to read it? I do. Uh, we used to do this all the time. We used to give lots of personal statement advice. If you want to dig into the archives, there's things you can do. There's probably links in the show notes. You can find these old episodes. Um, it used to be a blast and then it got a little bit too depressing uh, because <laughs> in our estimation, we're just not reading very good personal statements at all. And no matter how much advice we ever gave about it, they didn't really get any better. So we stopped giving the advice. But yep. We have uh, a personal statement here from Nathaniel who wrote in telling us, look, I, I think I took all of your advice. Can I, you know, would you please let me know if I am doing it right? Yep. All right. So here we go. I interned for the chief judge of the second judicial court of Florida, period. <laughs> what are you thinking when you read that first sentence? Well... I do like the fact that this applicant has legal experience, right? I don't love the use of the word interned, but. Well, yeah, um, you, you're choosing. So interned is like I worked, which is just a dead. It's kind of like a dead active verb. Yeah. Or it's an active verb, but it doesn't really say it's not. It's not a descriptive enough verb. Mm -hmm. So and especially choosing interned. I immediately picture you with a tray of coffees in your hand, right? Yeah, it's it's not ideal, but it's also, I mean, I'm glad that it's talking about something yeah. professional oh, and legal, yeah. right? It's That's a, great. It's a fact, right? It's just... I guess the interned is probably the thing that we would want to tweak in that first sentence. It's also... That's a very short first sentence. I'm okay and with I that. Think yeah, but the wait till you see the overall effect of it. Let me read the first okay. paragraph, maybe, and then we can talk about the overall sure. effect. I interned. For, so I'll start over. I interned for the chief judge of the Second Judicial Court of Florida, period. I prepared and filed over 2000 legal orders and spectated court cases, period. These legal orders included notices of intent to dismiss for failure to prosecute, DLOP, notices of intent to dismiss for lack of service, DLOS, and orders of dismissal. To prepare these orders, I reviewed every second judicial court judge's Excel spreadsheet, which included over 400 cases each. While reviewing each case, I searched through the case files to see if these judges' cases were all active based on the case management checklist. If a case was not active, I prepared, filed, and then sent out the appropriate order. How you feeling? A little dry. That's what I'm thinking here. And I know that we have repeatedly given the advice that you have to show yourself doing things at work, but this comes off robotic. This is like completely soulless. Mm -hmm. You're going to forget the name of the person who wrote that to you. Yeah. You know, it's where is Nathaniel? This is, this is a, uh, an intern bot. Mm hmm. What do you suggest as far as like giving it just a, a bit of humanity? Well, uh, journalists do this all the time. They pick a particular case or project that you worked on and dive into the details of that, as opposed to this 35,000 foot overview of everything. Yeah. That sounds like a like those sound like resume bullet points that you they then do. just put you like, oh, uh, all of these makes up a paragraph. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because people ask about resumes all the time and we're saying, no, your personal statement is not a regurgitation of your resume. So you're not going to talk about all the jobs you did. Um, you're only going to talk about one. But even then, we're not saying 
You're talking about everything that happened at the job. You're taking one bullet point and then you're diving into that bullet point and picking maybe one or two things about it that you're going to talk about. It's, it's like you're zooming in with a magnifying glass to illustrate your work ethic, your skills and what you've done. Yeah. And, and then we infer from that, that, you know, you did that everywhere else at that job. There's no winning there in that first paragraph, right? There's no, like you had this job and you did the things that the job required, but where are you doing? Like, are you excelling in that job or are you again, intern bought 3000 just, you know, that's the job. That's what you did. Yeah. I mean, it, 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 it lacks soul, but I will say that <laughs> this is astronomically better than so many other things too, where things can be just so bad, right? <laughs> talking about high school, talking about how they've always wanted to be a lawyer since they were a kid on the playground. I mean, at least <laughs> what would happen is someone would probably read a few sentences here and say, okay, um, sounds like they know the law next. They wouldn't keep reading, but it wouldn't, it probably wouldn't hurt you. It just is not going to end up helping you. Second paragraph. Additionally, I was allowed to sit through the proceedings of several court cases, period. Okay. I mean, what you were allowed to do is. Well, and you already said that you spectated court cases in the first or second sentence, which that already sounded kind of weak because spectated court cases. Yeah. Like, I mean, you know, courts are basically open. You can yeah. go sit in the gallery at any court case anytime. So, or most court cases. So I don't really see how that like you did. Okay. Why? What? For what purpose? Then I get a little confused here because Nathaniel says I was allowed to sit through the proceedings of several court cases. Then the very next sentence says I had to take notes of what was happening in these proceedings and ask questions to the judge I interned for afterward. That sentence is clunky as hell, by the way. Yeah, it's weird. It's like you were required to learn. Because <laughs> if you're going to ask, quite, you're not doing it for the judge. It's almost like you're doing it because they want you to be engaged and get something out of your internship. Yeah, I had to take notes and ask questions to the judge. Wait, so, okay, for instance, I yeah, I spectated a triple murder case and did not understand what happened during the discovery proceeding. After asking the judge, I learned that this phase of the pre-trial, pre-trial proceedings allowed both parties to present the evidence used during the trial. Okay, this is... This is really focusing on the internship side of your experience. It's emphasizing that you were there to be a student, not there to help or work. Yeah, you're telling me how naive you are in that second paragraph, right? It's like I was at a discovery proceeding and I had no idea what that was. So I asked the judge and the judge said, oh, this is where both parties present the evidence used during the trial. And it's like. That doesn't help a law school at all that you're that's like, oh, so you didn't know a simple thing about our justice system. Not that you're required to know a simple thing about our justice system, because we're going to teach you that once you get to law school. But what you, all you're doing there is you're showing up telling me that there was a thing you didn't know about the way courts worked. And so then you asked the judge. Yeah. I, you know, cynically, it makes me think that you might have been real annoying to this judge. Why not Google it? <laughs> <laughs> Why not Google it? Why not like figure out what it is that you're going to before you even go to it? Why not infer what's happening from the happenings themselves? Like when you're sitting there, can you not figure out that? Oh, I see. They're like presenting this. Here's what we're going to present. And here's what we're going to present. And it's like a little outline of how the trial is going to go down. I don't know. I, I would cut that entire paragraph. What do you think? Yeah. I mean, we don't even need to be cynical here. The The problem is more just that you're not, you're wasting real estate on learning as a, what you learned as yeah. opposed to what you did. It's mental states. We used to say yeah. that all the time, like, don't tell us about your mental states, but that's exactly what you're doing here because you say, um, I asked, yeah, I did not understand. That's about your mental state. 
I learned that's about your mental state. What did you do? Like, what did you, how did you contribute something? Mm -hmm. Not just what did you do? Cause I guess Nathaniel here is saying, look, paragraph. this is what I did. Hey, and, and, and even in the second paragraph, what did I do? <laughs> I, I went to these trials and I learned things. Well, okay. What did you do that contributed to your job? Yeah. Okay. Third paragraph, we're going to get more into this sort of like data dump. During the summer of my junior year, we don't care when that was, by the way, you could cut that. I accepted a part time court program specialist position at the same courthouse where I also prepared DLOP, DLOS and orders of dismissal. OK, <laughs> so more of the same from the first paragraph. Yeah. And also we talked about this a lot before because people do it all the time. The accepting of a job. I started a job. Oh, yeah. I accepted, I accepted a, job. a job. Yeah. I accepted uh -huh. a promotion. It's like just yeah. be the promoted person. Just be this the is program why we, specialist. The, yeah. <laughs> this is why we don't do personal statements on the show anymore. Because even people who claim to be a hundred percent following our advice just don't follow our advice. Yeah, we we don't. It's probably hear... the format, right? Like hearing it is one thing, seeing it edited yeah. on a page is another, and it's just not a great format for yeah. kind trying to convey this information. Don't write about applying for jobs. Don't write about accepting jobs. Don't write about your first day on the job, getting training. Those things are boring. Like give a, give me the, give me the big, like, what did you add? What's the value that Nathaniel is bringing to the table? Yeah. So instead of saying you accepted a part-time court program specialist position, just say as a court program specialist, comma, I did X. Yeah. Right. In addition, now this is going to maybe be good because it's new stuff. In addition, I attended court. I hate attended, by the way. <laughs> attended. Yes, it's very passive. It's just yeah. like you sitting there. Uh, we don't care about the meetings you attended. We care about what you did in those meetings yeah. or what you did because of those meetings. Which he crams into the next sentence or sorry, in the same sentence. So, okay. so check out what he does here to like ruin good stuff with boring, bad stuff at the beginning of the sentence. Nathaniel says, in addition, I attended court management conferences and drafted orders, setting trials, pre-trial conferences, motions, discovery, and witness and exhibit dates. What? Why is all that shit all crammed into one second part of a sentence that starts with you just sitting there in a conference? Yeah. Well, this is what we used to see so often is there would be one sentence that alluded to something substantive and we would say, okay, take that sentence and expand on it. You, you drafted orders setting trials. Okay. I don't even need to know all of those orders. I just want to know about one of them. You also like to capitalize a lot. I realize that the legal profession makes this mistake. So you're probably just doing what your, your role models did, but you don't need to capitalize all this stuff. Right. Yeah. yeah, exactly. OK, my role was to provide available dates on the judge's docket to the attorneys. Uh, you got to say that in some better way. Why don't you made my role be the subject of that sentence and you made the verb be was. Yeah, that, that's a super common phrasing that we used to see as well. We we edited all of these things. Um, yeah. You just say. I, <laughs> I provided available dates on the judge's docket to the attorneys. Don't just don't even talk about that. Talk yeah. about something else. Like you're, That's that makes scheduling. you look like a secretary doing not impressive things. So instead your next sentence, you say, if the chosen dates worked for the judge and the attorney, I drafted orders for the appropriate proceeding. What okay, does that, that look like? <laughs> what does it mean to draft orders? That is yeah. hard work. <laughs> What are you drafting? What are these documents that you're drafting? What, how, how does that work? And because, or are you actually drafting? I mean, that's exactly. the question that comes up is it's like when exactly. people say these things and they skip over them, you're like, Hmm, cause the drafting an order is no small shit. Right. Unless it is like, is it actually just copy and paste one paragraph of boilerplate? Is yep. that what your drafting of an order is? If that's what your drafting of an order is, then probably just cut it. Yeah, because like if you're trying to magnify 
your amazing role of scheduling the lawyers and the attorneys or sorry, the uh, judge and the attorneys. If that's all you're really doing here is scheduling. You know, not that that's bad. You can say I scheduled these meetings. OK, fine. But it's just not super impressive. And don't try to act like you're drafting documentation if you're not actually drafting documentation. If you are drafting these orders, then I think we need another sentence like what what do you mean by that? What you could that? have a whole personal statement about that. What decisions right. did you make to draft it in that way? Right. And what about really just one? Copying? I love your idea, Ben, the journalist thing of like find a representative example case where maybe it was a little more of a pain in the ass than others, mm -hmm. you know, and then you could have some flavor in here of like, well, one of the attorneys was going out on maternity leave and then the judge was going on a vacation and then it was like, to, and then the orders themselves, I had to draft, I had to go do this and that and this other thing in order to make this all work. And in the end, it all came out perfectly. That's the kind of thing that we need here to yeah. liven this up. Yep. Nathaniel goes on after the conference, I coordinated with the judge to ensure we had the exact dates for each case. It's more scheduling. Yeah. <laughs> how, how many sentences about putting things on the calendar? Yep. However, if our dates did not match, I emailed the attorney on the case to get the correct date. No shit. I mean, <laughs> yeah. you, you already said that you coordinated between the judge and the attorneys. You don't need another sentence about how you coordinated with the judge and another sentence about how you coordinated with the attorneys. Last paragraph now. So we've got three paragraphs that are like a bunch of resume bullets no humanity whatsoever. Uh, last paragraph. Yeah. Furthermore, furthermore. Yeah. It's the same as additionally, these are heavy words that you can always replace with also, or just drop entirely. Just drop them. Yeah. I didn't like the additionally at the beginning of the second paragraph. Yep. I don't like the furthermore at the beginning of the last paragraph. I reviewed each judge's caseload when I was not attending conferences. Each judge had their own Excel. <laughs> you do need to capitalize Excel, by the way. That's a brand name. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, the one thing you do need to capitalize. Yeah. And even better than that, just cut it. We know yeah. what a spreadsheet is. Just use <laughs> we the don't word care spreadsheet. Which kind of spreadsheet? Yeah. Each judge had their own spreadsheet consisting of all their open, reopened, and closed cases. I entered each case into the database to check where they were in the proceedings. For example, in a case set for mediation, I entered, quote, med set and included the date of the mediation. Most of the cases on these judges spreadsheets had over 400 cases, which you already said in the first paragraph. And now it just really looks like you're stretching. You know, I, do you feel the same way, Ben? Yep. Like trying to make it seem really big. Yeah. But it, it's like you, it's similar to like protesting too much where it's like, okay, you're hammering on the 400 cases. It didn't impress me the first time you said it. The second time you said it. Now I really am not impressed by it. Now I'm like, oh boy, you really think that's a lot, huh? Or that's a huge number. That's not 400 lines in a spreadsheet. Who gives a shit? Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. It's just not. It's not a good enough fact to include twice. That's for sure. Most of the cases on these judges spreadsheets had over 400 cases, many of which were closed. I ensured that our spreadsheets matched the database and included notes on why the case was closed. There were new cases before each judge almost every day. I updated and ensured that the number of open cases in the spreadsheet aligned with the database every week, period. And that's it. That's the last sentence of the personal statement. Yeah, Nathaniel's taking us very literally. Um, <laughs> maybe. Well, we <laughs> But but also not. I mean, there's things right. here that are left out. It's it's tough. Uh, these this is why these, we don't do it. Stop listening yeah. to our advice about personal statements. We give terrible advice about personal statements. Just don't <laughs> listen to us because it, the I mean because it's in not effect, working. Yeah. It just doesn't work, right? It's like yeah. this this didn't work. You need to this needs to be blown up and start over. There's no Nathaniel here. 
And there's no like I like I look at this and I go, OK, so I have learned that you have worked with judges and attorneys, which that's not nothing. That's great. But like, who the hell are you? Why do you want to go to law school? What what's it like to have you in my office? Yeah, I mean, if you're desperate for personal statement advice, uh, we could always connect you with Leslie. She's our in-house personal statement editor. Yeah, and Leslie's great. And um, you you can you can certainly um, if you want someone to clean up your your editing, like clean up your writing, Leslie can help yeah. a lot. She can also help you find a theme and a story. I, I would love to know what she would do with this. But I, I think that there's got to be like I'm just not getting a sense of any human at here at all. This is like a, a kind of a it's an overly robotic description of what this internship was to you. Yeah. You know what Nathaniel heard is he heard our advice to use I verb sentences because a lot Which of is these great. sentences. Yep. I reviewed, I searched, I spectated, <laughs> I learned, I accepted, I attended, but we, we need, we need to work on what you're focusing on as opposed to this high level. It's weird. It's, and this is super common. We saw this before. It's both high, super high level, but also extraordinarily detailed on things we don't care about like scheduling. Yeah. You need an anecdote. You need a thread. You need a case, one case, like one particular, you know, it could have been one of the judges that was hard to work with kind of, or one of the attorneys or one of the cases or one of the something. And like, let me see how Nathaniel is really greasing the wheels here. If that's what you did, you know, if you, if you made this whole shit run smoother, that's not coming across here. Like this looks like you're a cog in a kind of a rickety machine, right? It's like, okay, so what these judges are like, I'm already a little bit irritated that they're using spreadsheets to keep track of this stuff. And then apparently there is a database, but the judges have their own spreadsheets. It sounds like kind of a janky system, but I don't see you fixing the system at all. I just see you working within the system. You know, like, did you improve this process at all? Or did you just kind of show up and passively, where do I go now? What do I do next? Oh, you want me to do this? Oh yeah. Okay. All that stuff's good. But like, was there any, was there a moment where you like, did anybody ever tell you great job? <laughs> I guess. <Yeah. laughs> like think, think of a time where, where it was clear that you were adding something. Yeah. Thank you, Nathaniel. Uh, sorry if we did, if we, you know, you, I know you attempted to follow our advice, but for some reason, we're just not getting it. <laughs> we're not getting our point across, Ben. Yeah. So that's why we uh, sort of stopped. Yeah. So this next email from Carol might be kind of appropriate uh, to give some tips from uh, some some tips that might actually be useful for Nathaniel. So what's Carol say? Yeah, the subject line is soft factors. Hi, Ben and Nathan. Thank you for all you do. I would just like to share a YouTube video I came across from Dean Z. Uh, Dean Z is the dean at the University of Michigan Law School. Good advice for the quote, soft factors. What are your thoughts? And then um, we have a few of a few bullet points here. Bullet number one, numbers aren't everything. They love every law school loves saying that numbers aren't everything. They also say, oh, well, we deny or waitlist tons of people that are above their medians and about 10 percent of our class is below both. And Ben, <laughs> you're going to attack that fact. Yeah. Um, I mean, this is an if, LSAT skill, by the way. This is this is LSAT logical reasoning right here. This is the the Dean Z comes in with like, hey, numbers aren't everything. And as evidence for that, I'm going to show you that 10 percent of my class is below my median <laughs> LSAT and GPA. And yeah. Ben, an attorney, says, wait, so you're saying that 90 percent are above on at least one? That's. <laughs> That's a shockingly high number. A, a high, high percentage number. of your class is <laughs> yeah. needs right. Wait, to be only above. 10% is below on both? <laughs> really? So like 90% of your class is above the 50th percentile or at or above for both LSAT and GPA. Wow. Okay. So, I mean, her point is still valid. Numbers aren't 
everything. But that's a pretty easy claim to prove. What you're saying is that numbers are almost everything. Right. She's sitting beneath a giant door that says, you know, welcome to Michigan admissions. <laughs> and and it's like for the num, it's like, welcome if you have the numbers and 90 percent of the people go through that door. And then she's, though, loudly pointing at the other door. Yeah. Which is like, oh, oh, yeah, that line that wraps around the school four times and then goes in the side door. Yeah, yeah, that. Oh, yeah. Ten percent of our class gets in through that door. So, yeah, you sure. But I'd okay. love to know something else about those 10 percent. Are any of them from donor families? Or I don't. <laughs> yeah. And are any of them getting scholarships? No, yeah. they're paying full price. So it's yeah. like, sure, we do admit 10 percent of our class with, you know, shitty LSAT and shitty GPA for our school. We charge them a lot. Yeah. And that's not what you want to do at a school that gives a giant chunk of their class full rides, which Michigan does. Yeah. Anyway, from the video, we have some more bullet points here. Okay. So the, the question was, why do applicants with high numbers get waitlisted or denied? And then the bullets, according to them, are they give no sense of personality in their app. There's no zing. Which, I mean, there was definitely no zing in Nathaniel's personal statement, right? Like there, that needed a, a squeeze of lemon there. Yep. <laughs> because <laughs> that shit was just real bland. They seem arrogant or negative. We've seen that before a lot. We yeah. didn't see it here, really. Although yeah. Nathaniel, like, sort of pumping up what he had learned about our judicial system a little bit that I think might smack of arrogance sometimes to law schools where it's like, Hey, don't, don't claim, you know, things yeah. like, wow, you learned what pretrial proceedings are about. Yeah. But definitely not as arrogant as some things we've seen people. Oh, of many of them. Like I helped my, my, my friend file a small claims or whatever. And, you know, the, there's certainly we see personal statements where people like think that they're already attorneys and those are yeah. those are terrible. Um, three, they lack experience outside of the classroom Four, their app doesn't feel authentic or sincere. Any of that pop out to you for Nathaniel? Yeah, absolutely. It didn't feel authentic or sincere at all. No, it felt no. like any intern bot could have produced that. Yep. And that's partly our fault. I mean, we've we've emphasized yeah. facts so much, but the real challenge is picking those facts and it's very hard to convey that, I guess, or we suck at it. Other people probably can do it, but, but there are facts that are human, right? Yeah, I mean, there's yeah. like, if you told me a story, like I think people need to think of the personal statement as a story that makes your resume come to life. A story of facts, <laughs> not a story of your thoughts and opinions. Yeah. How do applicants with low numbers get accepted though, Ben? Well, point one, they convey excitement and interest in the school. Hmm. What's that okay. mean? <laughs> they know you're going to come and pay full price. Yeah. If you're yep. applying with terrible numbers, you better be ready to pony up. So you show them that you can, that you're willing, you know, Michigan is my number one choice. If admitted, I will accept without hesitation. I will immediately submit my deposit of cash. I and will pay deposit <laughs> in. Yeah. How do you want it? Well, you want Bitcoin? Yeah. Whatever you want. Right. So conveying excitement and interest in the school. Sure. That can get you in with terrible numbers. Just be ready to pay full price. Yep. Uh, bullet point number two. If they have supportive LORs. I imagine that sometimes people do have bad letters of recommendation. Yeah. That are where it's like, I don't know why this person's doing this. Yep. Or that are like similarly robotic. Like, yeah, yeah. So-and-so uh, took my class and got a name. Yep. You know, it doesn't. The Coming from really... someone that the school respects and um, has a lot of good detailed things to say about you could turn the tables for some school as long as they know you're paying full price. Third bullet point. There's something, quote, unusual and interesting about them. Oh, geez. That's going to invite a lot of odd personal statements. 
Well, I mean, and if you did do something incredible, right? Like I, my example has always been if you built like an orphanage with your bare hands uh, mm-hmm. on the top of Mount Everest or whatever, right? You're, you're like, if you did something that is like super baller, then, yeah. okay, I get it. You know, like you don't have the LSAT and the GPA because you're actually an Olympian. Like you won a gold medal in the Olympics. Yeah. Yeah. Well then, okay. That's like, yeah, yeah. You, you might be able to come on board, but, um, still probably going to have to pay though, but you could get admitted without the numbers. If you have truly amazing achievements in your life. Yep. <laughs> Last, uh, sorry. They, they, they seem like a good person <laughs> and they demonstrate excellent writing. I can well, see that. Sure. That could, that can be a proxy for, but there's always that fear that someone else is edit it to shreds. So you don't know. I don't know why she's relying on that actually, but, um, it's probably just bullshit filler. It's probably just a lie, you know, just a, and it's a business lie. It's not like she, it's just, you're trying to give this picture of doing a holistic application process and numbers aren't everything. And that's a fact that numbers aren't everything. That is true, but it's also very, very easy to prove. <laughs> Of course, there's something else beyond numbers. The question is, how much weight do they play? By the way, I looked up uh, Michigan's 509 report. Any guess what percentage of their class gets some sort of scholarship? Uh, what is the number? 85%. <laughs> wow. So let me think. So 10% of the class is below both their median LSAT and GPA. Uh, 85% of their class is getting some sort of a discount on their tuition. Hmm. Yeah. I wonder which people are not getting the discount. Hmm. Okay. Maybe though, some of those bullets might be useful for Nathaniel to liven your shit up a little bit. Anything yeah. more you want to say about that? Nope. Yep. Thanks for writing in. Uh, who was that? Carol. Anyway, let's uh, wrap it up there. You can be LSAT famous if you'd like. Please ask questions or share news with us at thinkinglsat.com. If you have questions about the LSAT demon, email help at lsatdemon.com. Check out our other podcast, LSAT Demon Daily. That was episode 389 of the Thinking LSAT podcast. Thanks all y'all for listening. Nice knowing you. Don't pay for law school.